Welcome to the Celebrating Women podcast, co-hosted by Mandy Montana and Ashley Fisher, a podcast that celebrates women, their issues, their thoughts, their lives, conversations that celebrate their gifts, their talents, their courage. It's the Celebrating Women podcast. Presented by Hand and Stone Massage and Facial Spa in Tyler, Texas. Hey, it's Mandy Montana at Hand and Stone Massage and Facial Spa in Tyler. You can give your skin the essential hydration it craves by moisturizing the Hand and Stone way. Chelsea Everett, the lead esthetician at the Tyler, Texas location, says keeping the skin moisturized stimulates skin barrier functions, which is crucial to the health of the skin. Chelsea, I know you've got three key tips on how to best take care of your skin daily. Do you want to give me those now? Three key things are keeping your skin moisturized, staying hydrated, and of course, wearing sunscreen. Moisturizing and especially hydration go together so well. You have to have that moisture barrier to hold that hydration in. Otherwise, you can drink gallons and gallons of water and it's just going to evaporate right out of the skin. Also, keeping the skin plump and slowing down the aging process a bit. But also, you know, wearing sunscreen. UV exposure is responsible for 80% of early facial aging signs. So it's crucial not only for preventative aging, but for preventative skin cancer. Chelsea, thank you so much for stopping by today. I just love your tips and I'm going to incorporate those into my daily routine. I so appreciate you stopping by today and for all of our friends that are listening. Remember, you can stop by Hand and Stone Tyler in the Cumberland Shopping Center to make your appointment or online at handandstonetyler.com. Welcome back to the Celebrating Women podcast. I'm Ashley Fisher. I'm Mandy Montana, and we have a lovely special guest today, my friend, Pastor, is that correct? Pastor or Reverend? Pastor's fine. Pastor Kimberly Carney of Fairwood United Methodist Church. Hi, friend. Hi, friend. I'm so glad to be here. I know. We've had so much fun already. I can't wait. I know. I know. And I'm... I'm so blessed to have met you through Junior League. I've just got to say that, that that's how we were introduced to each other. And we just happened to sit down at the same table one night. Um, I was a provisional last year. Kimberly is a provisional this year. And I think I was pouring a trim sticks into my mm-hmm. water. And she mm-hmm. was like, what is that? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we were instantly friends shortly yeah. after after that. Yeah, it's true. It's very, yeah. very true. Yeah, it's very true. I have a new material. I preached on Taylor Swift, Easter eggs and artificial intelligence. That's had- what I missed Sunday. Two Sundays ago, and I um and I used Chat GPT to help me write a <laughs> sermon. Chat GPT is the bomb. I'm so John, sorry, I missed that. On John two, yeah. So it was it was interesting, and I basically I typed into Chat. Well, a friend typed in Chat GPT for me. Um, he typed in um, write a sermon on John twelve using big words, <laughs> using big words <laughs> to make me sound smart, and he did. <laughs> And it presented two pages of what could have been an incredibly written, like, master's mm-hmm. level paper. And I'm like, where was this when I was in seminary? And <laughs> right. because I probably could have gotten better grades and probably could have brought up on plagiarism charges. But it's beside the point. Um, so, yeah, that was it was Taylor Swift, Easter eggs and uh, John 12 using AI and chat GPT. This past week, uh, two days ago, the sermon was if a donkey could talk. And it was from the, the Palm story, triumphant mm-hmm. entry into Jerusalem from the perspective of the donkey. <gasps> Okay, are these recorded? Like, do y'all live stream? They are on. They are, are on they? Facebook. Yeah, they're okay, all on Facebook. I'm gonna go look. I want to go That's back and true. check that out. So, yeah, my Taylor Swift one has like 1,200 views. I'm sure it does. God, I'm gotten viral. So she invited me to come to church, which a lot of people have done for the last 15 years, and <laughs> I've said no <laughs> to a lot of people. Mm-hmm. But I didn't say no to Kimberly, in part because of just her authenticity, mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. and friendship. And also, I was intrigued because she said that this was going to be her favorite topic to preach on. Yeah, it was my favorite verse. Her my favorite, favorite verse. Verses. Jesus flipping tables. And yeah. Mm. And yep. it was so good. Yep. And yeah. you have you have a lovely congregation. They were so welcoming and so nice to Chelsea and, and me. It was just really sweet. I'll yeah, be they back. really are. Like I um I have been blessed with an incredible congregation. They are a welcoming congregation. They they have um are are kind of like forming a new faith community. It's kind of cool how they came together um out of a lot of tragedy actually and like grief for a lot of people and found Fairwood and over the past, you know, year and few months, how they've just kind of come together and they're just such a cool congregation that just you walk in and you feel something different and mm-hmm. people walk in there and they're like wow I didn't even know I needed what yeah. Fairwood can offer and so I don't know I just the longer I've been in Tyler Texas and in East Texas which has not been that long 
I'm realizing like maybe what my call to this area and what my call to this place is and maybe what God wants me to do. And so it's kind of, it's kind of incredible to kind of look at ministry from a very different angle that I've not really looked at it before and how just authentic it comes out and how it allows me yep. the freedom to be the person God created me to be, which, you know, is probably not that bad to begin with. Listen, so. can we talk about it? Can we, let's just get yeah. on into yeah. it. Yeah, we, sure. Like, this just, is going to be so much fun. Yes. Sure. I'm so pumped because that has been the journey that I've been on the last year, year and a half of realizing that, you know, for years I, you know, was told like, you're, you're just, just see women's ministry on you. I'm like, mm. okay, cool. <laughs> What does that mean? What does that mean? Mm -hmm. But so often within the church walls, giftings and talents are hoarded unto the church by some places. And so that gets those giftings get relegated to only pastor or only worship leader or only um, children's pastor or whatever. Never in a million years did I ever get any kind of encouragement to, why don't you use your voice for a podcast? Or, hey, as you know, like you've got well, you this. did. It just didn't come from the church. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. It came. I think it came from above. Yeah. You got presented with two options at the same time. I felt like it was a pretty strong calling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, but then too, like, you know, um, hey, here's this disease that you've been dealing with your whole life. You didn't know it was a thing, but it is a thing. You've been raised in a church that would say, pray that thing away because God doesn't want you to be ill. And yet I've had it all along and now it's a platform to help thousands and thousands of women around the world. The things that I am doing right now, I would have, I feel like I might have been convinced out of them hmm. because, oh, you got a sickness? We won't pray that thing away. Or... Oh, you know, like you've got this gifting, use it in the church. Mm. You know, whereas when I'm sitting here talking and when I am, you know, using the other platform to help people, I am no more myself than like that's like this is who I am. And mm. you're and you're approaching them both with an intent to serve. Yes. Hmm. So and just it because all, it's not in the walls of a church. And it's been tricky. It's been very challenging to me to to not always be saying the name of Jesus, but I'm living it. That's who I am. He's very much and always will be a part of me, but he, I don't say Jesus in every conversation. And there's still a piece of me that feels like maybe I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> it's so funny that you say that. So I, in the denomination where I was brought up, the United Methodist Church, now granted, the older I get, the more I realize I was very, very blessed and privileged in the church that I grew up in. I have never been at, worked at, attended a church where there was not a female pastor. Mm. And there are people who I am their first female pastor in mm -hmm. every single church yeah. I go into. And so I realized from that place of spiritual and religious and denominational privilege that that has offered me opportunities to to discern and seek and find God's calling on my life that other women may never have. Right. And so to speak to your, you know, I, I feel like sometimes, you know, the spiritual gift hoarding of churches is sometimes because they are so scared that someone else might do it more effectively than they do. Oh, dang. Say it, girl. That <laughs> they tell someone that Much that is not woman. allowed. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah. so, and if you think about it, like, and, and I'm not saying that every single person that believes that women have a special place in the church is, is, is doing this, that hear me, hear me when I say that. However, I do think, and I have had people say to me, maybe this isn't working out for you, or maybe you're not being successful because you're doing something that God never called women to do. And I, I call bullshit on that because I feel like if you read the gospels, the first people at the empty tomb were women. Mm-hmm. Not scared men running away because they betrayed Jesus. But that's another, that's for this Sunday. Anyway, which is Easter. So I, I feel like sometimes we get so caught up in, this is my gift. I'm the only one that can have this gift. 
I'm the only one that can use this gift to bring people to know this incredible creator that, that we get stuck in the, that's my gift. You need to go find another one. Mm. And, and I've been guilty of that. Um, I have to realize that I am not, I am not everybody's cup of tea mm-hmm. and that is a okay. Yeah, that is, that is a okay. And for that reason, I actually have become more like, I don't want to say fearful, but I'm a lot more cautious in kind of showing my hand the first time I meet somebody. Mm -hmm. Like, I do not lead with, I'm a pastor. I don't lead with that. Because unfortunately, in this day and age, so many people are turned off by the hypocrisy of the church or the Mm -hmm. gift hoarding or Mm -hmm. the church saying, well, if you pray that away, which let's be clear, that is a false gospel Thank that you. is the false gospel of prosperity gospel. Mm-hmm. And God does not, God does not use things in our lives to punish us based on our level of spirituality. Oh. God does not do that. Yeah. My God does not do that. Mm-hmm. And you may have a completely different understanding of what that is, but to stand up and tell someone that they are sick with a scientifically proven diagnosis because they did not pray enough Or because they did not give enough Mm -hmm. or because they did not do enough or because they did not do what the pastor said. I, I I think that people need to be real careful with that because I do think there will come a day when karma will get them. And I think divine judgment will get them and they will realize that, that that is not truth. That that is not truth. And so I apologize on behalf of whoever that that was said to you, because why not use who you are and who God created you to be to further God's kingdom? Mm -hmm. And the the last thing that you said, newsflash, God's people are not in the walls of the church. I mean. God's people are outside the walls of the church Mm -hmm. and... I have thoughts on that too, that I can follow up with later, but, but for you to assume that the only people you are supposed to be ministering to are the people inside the church is like Jesus saying the only people who were called to be disciples were the people in the boat. So I would love to hear your thoughts on, um, this statement that was said throughout many years and said recently by somebody if you are ill, you are in error. Meaning you somewhere in there you're you're not plugging into your faith enough. So I I, I, will, I want to preface this by saying I have an initial reaction that is like who <laughs> I am authentically mm-hmm. and then I have a pastoral. Like I feel like there is a there is a a Kimberly response to everything. There's Mm -hmm. a pastoral response to everything. There's a theological response to everything. And sometimes the Kimberly response (laughs) when she feels really safe and the snark comes out Mm -hmm. has an, has an initial response. So my, my Kimberly initial response to that would be, so you're stupid because you're stupid. (laughs) (laughs) because that would be the logical thing right you're ill because you are in error well is your illness stupidity and ignorance Mm -hmm. and how has that gotten you to there yeah how far has that gotten you is it because you don't listen is it because you don't care is it because you just regurgitate what you hear so that would be my initial snarky kimberly reaction Mm -hmm. my theological reaction to that would be If we are all sinners and we all fall short of the glory of God, if if that is the claim that I would say most, most people would say, because we were given free will, then every single one of us are quote unquote sick in some way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. Because if wholeness and healing and perfection comes through the divine and is presented through the divine creator, whomever you feel like that is, for me, it is the monotheistic God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If that is, if that is what you believe, if perfection and wholeness and healing comes through the divine and we are not the divine because newsflash, we are not God, then we are going to be sick in some way, shape or form. 
and our illness comes from sin. Now, Mm -hmm. does that sin, can sin separate you from God? Absolutely. That's what separates us. However, I don't think in any way, shape or form that a child born with Tay-Sachs disease has erred in any shape or form possible. I do, I do not believe that. So if you're going to trace that logic theologically, then that's where you would have to be. And, and my God doesn't, I, my God doesn't do that. Also, do I think we live in a world that has made decisions that put toxic chemicals into the world that we consume in our bodies that are being consumed at a much higher rate than they ever have been? Absolutely. And because of that communal sin, if you will, we are all the recipients of stuff that should have never been in our body to begin Mm -hmm. with. Yeah, right. We weren't designed for it. I am an addict of Coca-Cola classic. Mm-hmm. Don't ask me if I want Pepsi. I'm going to tell you, no, I want Coca-Cola classic from a fountain. That's what I want. Is that good for me? No, ma'am. Absolutely not. <laughs> Will I still drink one every once in a while? <laughs> yes. yes, Absolutely. <laughs> for my sanity and everyone else's. But I know in making that choice that I may be affecting my body. I know that there are some things that happen when our bodies are created that just do not give us a good hand. They Mm. just don't. And there's nothing that we can do about some of that. There's absolutely nothing that we can do about some of that. And I feel like for someone to make the statement you are sick because you messed up is a cop out because for them to say it's your fault means that they don't have to dig into who our God or their God really is because it is tough to wrap your mind around the fact that a God who is a perfect divine creator might create someone with an illness that they will live with for the rest of their lives. That is really difficult for some people to wrap their mind around. It is. And yet, It shows me that they're not open or aware of all the beautiful things that come from challenges. Mm -hmm. And I I think, Mm -hmm. too, it shows a little bit of a lack of understanding of what eternity is. Absolutely. Because this life is just Mm -hmm. a breath. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Like, it feels, when we're in it, I mean, it feels like forever and a day. But there will come a day when we go, dang, that was a breath. Mm -hmm. It was simply a breath. And any suffering that we endured... What did we do with it? That's that's my yeah. thing now. I don't sometimes and I don't know, I'd like your opinion on this. Do you agree or disagree that there are times when things happen where faith ch- like would you would be challenged to believe for like no, this is this is in this situation like God, I believe you have more for me than this. A- absolutely. Absolutely. I I think, I think sometimes our human brains limit God so much because our human brains cannot understand it. Yeah. And I think sometimes we do our best to help someone in a situation by using human words when human words really will not help. Mm -hmm. They, They won't. And I think we have been so designed and so instructed by society that if we don't have an answer, we look stupid Mm -hmm. that it actually does a disservice for us especially in the church yeah specifically in the church yeah because because we try to put our put ourselves in the position of being god's voice to god's people speaking for him and sometimes stupid stuff flying out of our mouths yes and and like to speak to that like i i remember a time and I, i talked about this in my sermon on sunday you know i i told a story i was talking about like um smaller characters throughout the Holy Week story, how, you know, you have these people that are mentioned once and they get a sentence in in the entirety of this entire story that is the Palm Sunday, Holy Week passion story of, you know, Jesus coming into Jerusalem, the the Last Supper, the trial, all all of it. And, And how sometimes in the midst of some of our deepest faith crises, it's one person that you do not know that steps in and says something profound and changes your life forever. Yeah. And, and, you know, I, I told that story 
basically I was, I was going up, I was in, I was in Nashville, Tennessee. And, you know, I had known since 15 that, that being a pastor is, is what I was called to do. Mm-hmm. I, I, I knew from a very early age, not a lot of people do. And, um, I was going up for this committee to become a certified candidate, which was like the next step to like go on to being ordained or whatever. And I was in seminary. I was two years done with seminary. Like my, my trajectory was like, I had a path and the committee told me, we don't, we don't think you have what it, what it takes to cut it. Like we don't think you are going to be a good pastor is what they said to me. And I was devastated. I mean, devastated. Like here's all this money, all this time, all this effort, all these people like who have literally, I mean, my course was set. It was set. And I remember just being absolutely devastated, crying, hysterical, sitting in my car. And this woman walked out to my vehicle and tapped on the window. And I rolled down the window I can't tell you what she looked like. I can't tell you what her name is. I had never seen her before. I have not seen her since, but she looked at me and she said, those are humans in there, not God. Mm. Wow. And, and, and I look back on what was a very difficult, you know, journey to get where I am. And I think to myself, without that conversation, I would not be in Texas. Yeah. I would not be sitting here. I would not have done some of the things that I've done. I would not have met some of the people I've, I've met and had some of the experiences I've had. And at that moment, I would have told you that that was the lowest point of my life. Mm-hmm. But the strength I had to gain and the perseverance I had to have and the, the willingness to listen to somebody's voice that was indeed bigger mm-hmm. than all the human voices mm-hmm. that were telling me something – has carried me th- through some of the most difficult times of my life. Right. Yeah. And 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 I I I don't want to I I'm I'm real careful to say I don't think God made that happen to me because mm-hmm. it was it was devastating and yeah. some of the things they said can cannot be taken back. But I don't think that God caused that to make me better. I don't mm-hmm. think that God did that so I would end up in Tyler, Texas in no, but he, 2024. No, but he can bring beauty from ashes. But absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think that's what it is because I I don't I really don't think that that the God that I serve wants his creation to suffer. Like I really don't think that. But I do think that he gives us people and things and strength to get us through the suffering. Yeah, because we're in the world that we're in. And yes. it's not it's not the it's not what he originally intended. And also, in order to be truly love, you have to give people choice. Mm-hmm. Otherwise he would have made robots. Otherwise if he mm-hmm. had said, Adam and Eve, you will love me and you will adore me and you have no choice in the yep. matter. It's like, you know, Mandy and I were talking about, I was talking about my, um, we were talking about our proposal stories from our husbands. And um, I, before my husband proposed, I was really put out and I was like, God, what the heck? What's with this dude? Why won't you tell him to propose to me? And he said, Ashley, when you get to the end of that aisle, do you want to be staring at the face of a man who I told had to be there or who wants to be there? Mm. Mm. That's love because love is a choice. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, God would have made for himself a bunch of little robots that mm-hmm. all hail King Jesus. But, you know, what what value is it if it's not out of the the deepest recesses of our soul, the choice that we make every single day to look up at him and say, this world sucks, but I love you. Or the choice not to. Yes. Like, like the choice not to, like the longer I am in this community, the longer I am in East Texas, the longer I am just meeting people and and learning people is that is just that, you know, I, I, I tell people when I do tell people what I do and that I'm a pastor, I, I usually get one of, you know, three responses, which is, 
oh, I go to so-and-so church and this is, I love it. And I, you know, I love God, whatever, or, you know, I haven't been to church in a while and, but I'm really trying to, and I'm, I'm like, I'm not asking for your story. I, <laughs> I, you know, if you tell me you're a mechanic, I don't tell you what the mileage is in the last time I got an oil change. But like, I mean, if you, if, if that's what you need to do, you know, go it's, it. it's fine. Like if you tell me you're a doctor, I'm not, you know, going to tell you what my A1C is, but like <laughs> it, like, I mean, it, it just, Somewhat. it just, it happens, right? It just yeah. happens. Mm-hmm. And You know, I have found that I have found that there are a lot of people that say, I, I, I don't go to church. I'm not religious. I'm spiritual, but not religious. Mm -hmm. I, I think the church is a bunch of malarkey, you know, I, I, you know, whatever. And, and when I get those answers is when I'm like, tell me more, tell me more. And typically, you know, out of when, when somebody says to me, you know, I'm not religious. I never want to step foot in a church again. I think you're a bunch of hypocrites. I, you know, I can go and do good and, you know, treat people well without ever walking into our church again. And, and, and I'm like, yeah, okay. And they're kind of like taken back. And, but what I find is when I ask a follow-up question, nine times, nine times out of 10, I ask this question. And the question is, are you done with the church? Are you actually an atheist or an agnostic? Or were you just never given the opportunity to question the narrative that was shoved down your throat? Oh, A- my gosh. Man. And and Ooh. nine times out of ten, it's it's the second one. Yeah, Mm. it's, 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 yeah. Yeah. And sometimes it's no, I've done the research. I really am an atheist because I'm like, you know, whatever. And I'm like, cool, that's great. Let's have a conversation because I'm all about that. But you can, I can usually tell within the first couple conversations (laughs) with someone, it's not that they don't believe in a God. It's not that they, that they don't want a relationship. It's that they were forced into a relationship that fit a certain model Mm. and they were never given the opportunity and the freedom to question that narrative and to think outside the box, usually because the church, the doctrine of the church or the people that they were around told them something and they were not comfortable with the questions. Mm Mm-hmm. (laughs) <laughs> and I, we're, we're, I la- we're laughing because we're in agreement with you, yes, Kimberly. Yeah. Yes, and yes. I feel and, like and, it is my <clears throat> job to allow people a place mm-hmm. to ask for an alternative narrative. I'm, cur- you. I'm curious. Have it, it, And this is why I've not been to church much because I am so darn curious about all the things and I have so many questions, Yeah. but it's truly out of a desire to understand and I'm okay with not knowing, mm-hmm. but I also want some nuggets. So all that to be said, have you read or listened to Richard Rohr at all? Yes. Do you know who I'm talking about? Yes. Um, I find him fascinating. Yes. And I listened to a podcast episode. I've listened to it more than once because I love it so much. It's a two-part episode. Brene Brown interviews him. Oh, yeah. Have yeah. you listened to that I one? I love Brene Brown. Okay, so... I want to be her when I grow up. Me too. <laughs> me too. And the conversation between the two of them brings me so much joy because this man who's been studying, you know, theology mm-hmm. and, and practicing for so many years, when she asks him questions, often his answer is, I don't know, with a giggle. And to me, like, that's the whole point of like mm-hmm. faith, right? Yeah. Like there's, there's some intentional mystery to this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's some intentional figure it out on your own, kind of like write your own adventure story, right? Like there's, and to me, I think that's part of the reason I got so frustrated with church is because like you're saying, like people who are uncomfortable with the unknown mm-hmm. and are uncomfortable with not having the answer Try to would make challenge me mm-hmm. and try to make something up or mm-hmm. force mm-hmm. force me down a path or force me down an answer when sometimes I just want to ponder about something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know? And and I, th- I think, not that there's yeah. not a truth. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. Not that there's not a truth within, but also like there's a lot of gray in the world. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of beauty in that gray. Yes. Like I th- I think, you know, I had somebody tell me one time, um, he is now a very successful pastor in a church that 
I would not choose to attend, <laughs> but, um, but that's okay. Like he is, he is doing God's work and he is fulfilling his call. And I am more than happy for him and his family. Um, I, he said to me one time, he said, you know, there's a whole lot of black and white in the Bible. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, like love your neighbor as yourself. And, um, you are not God. And, you know, things like that. There is a lot of black and white in the Bible, but there's also a whole lot of gray. And I do believe that that is a living, breathing document inspired by God, but written by man. Mm -hmm. And, and there's a, that leads a whole lot of gray and there's a whole lot of beauty in the gray. And sometimes that beauty comes in the not knowing, Mm -hmm. the not knowing, you know, I am a person who likes to fill awkward silence with words. It, it makes me feel like I am fixing something. But, but I have to, to, to ask people sometimes, are you, are you telling me this because you want me to listen or because you want me to fix it? Because those are two different things. And I will listen in two different ways. And sometimes you just got to sit in the suck. Mm-hmm. You just got to sit in it. And there's a great story in the Bible about somebody sitting in the suck and his name is Job. Yeah. And it's not fun. And no one wants to be in their Job error. Mm -mm. But even Swifties (laughs) have one, right? No one wants to be in their Job error, Mm -hmm. right? No one wants that. But you got to be in your Job error to be and appreciate the Jesus era. Like you really do. Well, and here's what I used to hate the book of Job. Hated Mm. it. I hated it because I'm like, I don't like the thought that this could happen to anybody. I don't like that it happened to him. He wasn't doing anything wrong. He didn't do anything. And all this horrible stuff happened to him. And then I found out there's a little thing called the Chronological Bible. And Job is one of the earliest books. And then when I read Job, it was... And you read the Bible as this full thing and you don't take just sound bites out of it and you read it in context from beginning to end and you realize, oh, Job was the setup because there is a moment where Job says, would that there was somebody that could take this from me. He was setting the whole thing up for Jesus, like all of this stuff. It was like he was presenting the need for a savior. And nobody wants to be in Job's position, but Job's position, it going to happen. It, there's going to be crap that happens. Mm-hmm. And so, okay, so in the suck, I'm just going to get all nerdy with, I'm just, I want to nerd out a little bit with the, this theology stuff, because this has all been stuff I've been chewing on for mm-hmm. the last couple of years. Do we have the authority as children of God to speak to something and command it to flee or to command it to go, be it sickness, be it, I don't know, whatever. Do we have that authority and that power according to the word of God? I think it depends on how you define authority Mm -hmm. and it depends on in whose name you are doing something. Okay. And I say that as kind of a pinpoint to say we in society manifest is a buzzword right now. Right. Mm -hmm. And I, and I said it, I think I said it yesterday. I said, I'm going to manifest that we are going to have X many of people there for Easter Sunday. Right. Because even in my denomination where I don't, I mean, numbers matter, right? Like, I mean, you got to, you got to write down an attendance number, right? You got to print enough bulletins. You got to have enough seats. I mean, you, you It's just how it is, right? Mm -hmm. You got got to have metrics, right? And I said, I'm going to manifest that we have X many people here for for Easter Sunday, right? And I was totally joking about it. But then I did the work to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And that is sending emails, Mm -hmm. calling people that hadn't been there. Mm Mm-hmm. Letting people know that Easter's a great time to visit because there's going to be a whole bunch of other visitors and there's going to be a lot of CEOs there. 
Christmas and Easter only people and like <laughs> all of those things. And so like, like you're gonna, sorry, it, you're took gonna me a minute. it took me a minute. I had, I had to put the acronym together. I'm sorry. Sorry. So like people who like will not walk in a church for another mm-hmm. like six months or whatever. Yeah. And, and one time somebody said, are you okay with CEOs? And I was like, Christmas, Easter only people. Sure. Mm-hmm. As long as they bring a check. And that's totally a joke. That is not true. <laughs> you do not have to bring a check to come to Easter Sunday. We would love for you to put something in the offering plate. But if it's your contact information, I'm totally okay with that. So, but that being said, like, so I said manifest and I was like, you know, but, but you have to do the work behind it. Mm-hmm. If you are given a diagnosis and the doctor says you have this disease, I'll, I have PCOS, you have PCOS. With insulin resistance, right, Mm -hmm. which many millions of women in this world, they've probably had it since the beginning of time. They just did not do the research to figure out what what it was and and all this stuff, right? That's a whole other conversation about how women haven't had enough research about their health. So, (laughs) so like PCOS, if I were to say in the name of Jesus or in the name of God, I rebuke this disease. Yeah but continue drinking Coca-Cola classic seven times a day Mm. and never work out and, and do not control my stress and do not see a therapist and, and do not take the medications that will help me do that. I will not, I will not do well functioning with that disease. Yeah. Because contrary to popular belief, and this is what I love about the United Methodist church, God gives us a brain. Mm Mm-hmm. And God says, you shall love me with your whole heart, soul, and mind. Mm-hmm. And, and I think that we sometimes forget that God does put intellectual resources in our lives, like doctors, science, mm-hmm. research, homeopathic medicines, the ability to, to make decisions on how we treat our body. That is part of it. Mm-hmm. And so for, and again, I think, do we have the authority? Sure. Can we do it? Yeah. But I think you got to follow up. It's kind of like saying, I want to be the best disciple ever. And you never pick up your Bible and you treat people like shit. Like, I mean, mm-hmm. that, I mean, that is not, it doesn't track, right? Like the math doesn't math. And so like, I think you have to figure out what your goal is. And absolutely, you rely on God to get you there, Mm -hmm. but you also have to do the hard work. Mm -hmm. The disciples had to do the hard work. Yeah. We have to do the hard work. Yeah. Jesus didn't sit on his butt either. I'm pretty darn sure (laughs) Jesus said, take this cup from me. (laughs) And God said, you got to do the hard work. Mm -hmm. And he did it. And, you know, God took the cup from him and he's sitting at the right hand. And I, I feel like... We sometimes say things like, I'm going to manifest this, but then we don't do the follow-up. Do you think that some of that prosperity gospel or the, and then especially as it relates to, um, you know, your more charismatic churches who will say, you got a headache? I would declare in the name of Jesus for that headache to flee in the name of Jesus. Do you think that that comes from a, like... Oh gosh, I had it in my head what I was going to ask you. I'm uncomfortable with discomfort. And so there yes. needs to be an answer for that. <laughs> yes. This this t- 2-year-old should not have cancer. So I am going to pray the walls down and tell it to go and it doesn't and the 2-year-old passes away. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like what is that? I, I th- so so this is like fun. I, I First of all, I do believe in the power of prayer. Mm-hmm. I, I do believe that there is a power in prayer of a community when you yourself do not have the strength to pray on your own. Yeah. Um, and, and I do feel like knowing that there are other people shouldering that burden with you mm-hmm. in a community. Right. Like there is, There's there, blessings there is that. some, there is some, some strength in that. And, and I will say that like. You know, I'm going to say this, and this may be controversial, but at the end of the day, and I I, I don't believe in, you know, total depravity. I I don't really believe in predestination. I I, I don't really, I I don't really 
that is that is not my doctrine. Mm-hmm. That is that is not my theology. That is not my doctrine. There are decisions that are made in this world that affect us. There are decisions that we make in this world that affect others. There are natural anomalies that happen Mm -hmm. that a two-year-old gets a horrible type of cancer. And every single person is on their knees praying, and that child still dies. Mm -hmm. What are you praying for? Are you praying for ultimate healing, Mm -hmm. which we've already said Mm -hmm. comes through God and not necessarily in this world? Right. Are you praying for God's mercy, not always what you want to happen Mm -hmm. or are you praying to prove that your prayer is heard over someone else's? Mm -hmm. And I think those are three different things. I think those are three different things. I think you can pray for peace. You can pray for rest. You can pray that the doctors think of every single solution. And I think and, and I think that absolutely that happens. Mm-hmm. Absolutely that happens. Sometimes I just need people to pray for me because I forget to pray for myself. Yeah, yeah. I think that there are things in this world that happen. And, and I, I mean, I'm, I'm going to use a personal example. My father was in a horrific car wreck, horrific car wreck um, in November of 2022. He was in the, the, the trauma ICU for eight days eight days he was in the trauma ICU and I remember just feeling the power of people praying for me and Mm -hmm. my family when when I literally did not have the strength to do it yeah and you know I remember you know they call it the trauma coaster you know that's what I call it when I worked the trauma floor like the trauma coaster you have one good day and three bad days and then two good days and you know back and forth and so I you know ultimately my father died from his injuries. Mm. And and it was a car wreck in a truck on the way back from a hunting trip that was driven by his best friend and his best friend survived. Mm. Right? You can't tell me that either family was a better Christian. You can't yeah. tell me that either family, I mean hell, I'm a pastor. They didn't have a pastor in their family like what, right, I mean right. if, I mean if you're looking at the I mean if you're yeah. looking at the check marks in the columns, mm-hmm. right? That should be a big one. I mean you that, think? I I should get some type of kudos for that, right? But I didn't. Yeah. But when I look back and I think about what I prayed for. Yeah. A life that my father, that would be abundant, that would be life-giving. Yeah. True healing Mm -hmm. and God's mercy. And that's what I got. Are you still praying for Kimberly? To find peace and comfort and strength. So what's funny is that this whole grief thing, Mm -hmm. it's not linear. No, it's not. It's not Mm -hmm. linear (laughs) at all. Like it's, it's like this, it's like a roller coaster that literally keeps you on it. Like you cannot get off. Yeah. Like you cannot get off of it. And you know, it comes and ebbs and flows. And like, I think that, I think at times, like there are times when I'm like at peace with it. And then there are times when I'm like, this really sucks. That wasn't fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's not. And God never said that your life was going to be fair. But he said it would be good. And it is. It is. It really is. And I think that sometimes we want to have so much control and we use prayer as our way to control. And when things don't go our way, we try to find a reason that it didn't go our way. And we think, what did I do? Right. What did somebody else do? It's somebody else's fault. It's, it's whatever. And sometimes it's just what happens. Yeah. It's just what happens. Yeah. So when we pray for healing, you know, that word of faith movement would say that healing is healing right now. Right now. Absolutely. (laughs) Absolutely. But healing in a biblical sense might be more... Of the heart wrenching prayer of oh. ultimate healing. Oh, absolutely. Meaning that it might not happen this side of heaven. And I think that's the hardest prayer as a pastor yeah. to tell somebody. Yeah. What is your goal? Yeah. Because we have incredible science that can give somebody quote unquote life. Right. Yeah. But gosh, Jesus came that we would have life and have it abundantly. Mm. What does that look like for that person? Yeah. Not for me. 
because it's going to make it easier for me. Right. What does it look like for that person? Right. And I think the same thing is true with like, you know, you could say that with relationships. You can say that with, you know, jobs. You can say that with, with whatever it is. If you truly want God's best for you, you better be prepared for <laughs> God's best for you. Yeah, because our idea and his, our ways are not his ways. Our thoughts are not his thoughts. Do you believe God speaks now to his people? I do. I do think God speaks now through his people, but I also think that people speak what they want God to speak through his people. Yeah. Yeah. Can y'all unpack something for me? Because I'm a bit of a novice in comparison. You guys know so much more <laughs> than I do. And I'm, I'm fully okay with that. I like being around you so I can learn more. But this has been coming up for me um, in the probably the past, like, things come in threes often. Uh-huh. And certain mm-hmm. words and ideas come up for me repeatedly. And then I'm like, okay, I'm supposed to pay attention to this. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So the thing that's been coming up that I don't understand, and it's been kind of tossed around as if I did understand it, mm-hmm. is prosperity gospel. Yeah. Mm. Can you explain to me what that is mm-hmm. and why it's a bad thing? Because it sounds like it would be a good thing. Like just if, if you don't have any context yeah. and you hear prosperity right. and you hear gospel, mm-hmm. and like those sound like two positive things. And, and you know, what's mm-hmm. wrong with that? Absolutely. So talk to me about that. So, and, and I can throw this gentleman's name out. He makes plenty of money. He's probably not going to listen to this podcast. It's fine. If he wants to come after me, he can. Joel Osteen. Okay, mm-hmm. yeah, I've heard of him. Joel Osteen will say things like, if you pray the prayer that God has called on your heart, which is the prayer I'm about to tell you, and if you give in a way that hurts to this ministry, God will bless and ordain your life. So let me unpack that for a minute. So he is asking you to pray his way and tithe in abundance to his church in order to then receive all the things that God is intending to bless on you? Absolutely. Okay. Kind of like in the old, um, you know, Christian TV show, Christian network. If you send a donation minimum of $50, I'm going to send you this prayer cloth and you're going to be healed of everything, every ailment. Those oh sort of my things. goodness. Yeah. Okay. Well, now I'm, I'm having a bit of understanding. Yeah. In the Catholic church, <clears throat> they called it indulgences. Okay. Where you would go to the priest and you would give money to the priest and the priest would absolve you of your sins. Oh yeah. I've heard about that. Same okay. thing. Okay. That's the Protestant version. So, <laughs> okay. <laughs> what was it that you said earlier? I found it to be really like, okay, this is how I, this is how I've been feeling all along, but hadn't put it in such succinct, lovely words. Didn't you say the Bible's written by man, inspired by God? Inspired by God and written by man. Yeah. So I think you have to, I think for me, that's something I always have to remember. Mm -hmm. Like I always, I don't know, pretty much since I understood the history of how it came together. (laughs) Mm Mm-hmm. And I actually learned it in art history of all places. I didn't learn it in church. No. <clears throat> um, but I, I, not only was it written by man, it was written over like what hundreds of years yeah. in different places, I and then it convert- was yeah. selected by yeah. a select few yes. men. Yes. In a very powerful, powerful church. Yes. So, I mean, like when you think about the filtered process of all of this, right, like it makes me, it doesn't make me question the truths within the Bible, but it does make me, it does make me pause and think about what are the truths within all of this? So what's the gospel within the gospel? Right. 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 Yes. What what is, what does it Mm -hmm. boil down to? And it boils down to the same things that you believe in. Mm And it, that just makes so much more sense to me. Like, I, it's why I feel like when people do start like proof texting, I get so frustrated because I'm like, okay, how many books and how many pages and how much context and how many years and how much of this do you really understand? And have you only been taught this by one specific, da, 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 da. like I get really like in the weeds on it because I'm going, are you parroting something that you heard from someone because that's all you know, and it's easier for you to be comfortable in parroting something that you heard one time that you latched onto than investigating and questioning and really understanding mm-hmm. the truth of it? It's interesting to me because people people ask me, you know, people have said, how do you like, where does it end? Like, where, where do you, where, what is the definitive spot where you say, that's what I believe? Mm. And you look at this whole story. And you look how we are continuing this story, 
right? Mm-hmm. I was talking about how like the Passover feast was the story of God's people out of Egypt and how we continue that feast as Christians through the Holy, through Holy Communion and the Eucharist. And um, mm. when it comes down to it, I look at what Jesus said about it. And there are more than four Gospels about Jesus. A gospel is just an eyewitness account of Jesus, right? So there's the gospel of Mary. There's a gospel of Thomas. There's a gospel of Bartholomew. There's a gospel of Judas, where Jesus talks about how and why he did what he did, right? So there are all these books. And when you read it and you talk about like, what did Jesus say about specific things, right? Jesus said absolutely nothing about who you love. Jesus said that you love. Even the woman who had committed adultery and was about to be stoned, he said, go and sin no more. But then he looked at other people and he said, yeah, you without sin cast the first stone because you're supposed to love her. But the thing about adultery is this. Adultery is a word that's also used for the relationship between us and God. Mm, talk to me about that. So, so there are different types of covenants, covenant relationships in the Bible. Mm-hmm. There, there's, there's the type of covenant that can, that is entered into like a contract, right? There's a contract. If one or the other side breaks the contract, then the contract's null and void. Mm-hmm. There's the type of covenant that's like a marital covenant, right? It's a covenant between two people. It should not be easily broken. And yeah, technically one person could break that contract, but really both people have to agree to break that contract, mm-hmm. right? Then there's the covenant between us and God. That covenant cannot be broken because God's still going to have a relationship with us, whether we want it or not. Right. Mm -hmm. So there are different types of covenant and it talks about how Jesus is like, we are the church. Jesus is like, we're, we're the, Jesus is the groom. We're the bridegroom. Mm -hmm. And you have all of these great parables about weddings. And that's why Jesus's first miracle was at a wedding. Right. Um, Because at that wedding, people were saving the good wine For the good people, Mm -hmm. just like people try to scapegoat and gatekeep the gospel for the good people. Right. And Jesus was like, that's not how this works. I'm for everybody. God's for everybody. So I'm going to create wine that everybody can have. So they're all equal. And when you think of it in that way, it blows your mind. It's hard to wrap your mind around. It blows your mind about that. I used to tell people what I wanted to do when I get older was save the world. The world's been saved. You're just telling everybody how it was saved. The world's been saved. They just got to know they're worthy of it. Mm. And the church does a damn good job of telling people that they're not worthy of it. Yes. So how do we correct that, Kimberly? Well, I think you have a pastor that says the church does a damn good job of doing things wrong. Like, I think, I think that's <laughs> like the just beginning of owning it. it taking I, responsibility. I think you got to own it. And yeah. I, think that's, I think that's one of the things that I, I try to do mm-hmm. is when people come to me and they say, I was told that I could not come to church anymore because I had a baby out of wedlock. Mm -hmm. And I say, I have a church that you can come to. Mm -hmm. I am sorry that that happened to you. I recognize that I am part of that history Mm -hmm. because I am a Christian. I recognize, I recognize that whether I have ever done anything that a pastor has done wrong, I am part of that because I have the title pastor. I recognize that because I am a United Methodist elder, I am part of everything that United, that the United Methodist church has done that is wrong because I am United Methodist. But I also know that I now have a chance through my words and my actions to change that narrative. And if nothing else, give people an opportunity to hear a different narrative. The narrative of Jesus is love hands down, Mm -hmm. hands down. The narrative of God is love. The narrative that I want people to know is that God created you. You are created in a divine image. And I say God for a reason, because if you need your God to not be a man, because men have messed you over, God's okay with that. God is okay with that. I use inner gender language for God all the time because I do not want that to be the, I don't want that to be the stumbling block. I really don't. That should not be the reason that you don't have a relationship with God. God created you. God loves you. God sent his son to have a relationship with you and who died for you. And there's absolutely nothing you can do about that. You can't fight it. Like, you, like, <laughs> no, you like I mean, you, you can, I mean, you can try to fight it. Absolutely. But God's still going to love you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. People will tell you God doesn't love you. 
and shame on them because at the darkest and deepest parts of their life, God still loved them. Yep. And I think that's the biggest disservice we as Christians do to each other and the church does to people. And I lament for that every single day. And every day I wake up hoping and praying that I can be the pastor, that if nothing else, they know that God loves them and there's absolutely nothing they can do about it. The Celebrating Women podcast wants to hear from you. Email us a voice message to celebratingwomenpodcast at gmail.com. We would love to hear your story or the story of an incredible woman you know. Become part of the conversation on social media, facebook.com slash celebrating women podcast. On Instagram, search celebrating women podcast. The Celebrating Women podcast has been presented by Hand and Stone Massage and Facial Spa in Tyler, Texas. Book your appointment today. Stop by the spa in Cumberland Shopping Center or online at handandstonetyler.com. The Celebrating Women podcast is created and hosted by Mandy Montana and Ashley Fisher. Support the show for as little as $3 per month at celebratingwomenpodcast.buzzsprout.com or visit our show notes. Thank you for listening. And don't forget to subscribe to the Celebrating Women podcast.